music? China? What do they even say? <laughs> what is this Chinese rap music? Sounds like they're just saying ching ching chong. My chance to go watch Made in China. We play ping pong ball Made in China. Hello and welcome to China Econ Talk, a sub-China power podcast. I'm your host, Jordan Schneider, here today with Matthew Brennan, professional speaker, expert on all things Tencent, and the host of the very cleverly named China Tech Talk. <laughs> a pleasure, Jordan. A pleasure. So, Matt, what brought you to China and ultimately to covering Tencent professionally? Oh, that's quite a story. So, I'll give you the short version. I, I've been in China for coming on 15 years now. Started off straight out of uni. I uh, came here to teach English, actually. Stayed to learn Chinese. Stayed to do some entrepreneurial ventures with a couple of friends. Spent a couple of years in Inner Mongolia, opening up English language schools in property ghost towns and, and things like that. Later went off to work uh, for the company that we franchised from. And I went and worked in Dalian for a couple of years in their head office. And then I opened this R&D division for them. And I was running a team in Chongqing for a couple of years doing... Uh, online content and uh, we had illustrators and 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 people doing flash and things like that and creating all these sort of materials for this education chain and then like the the, the when i moved into this area was really around about 2014 2015 which was when wechat was really really hot it was really taking off and it was really starting to change china we started using it for marketing purposes and and back then I think we we opened probably one of the first English language WeChat accounts, official accounts. When I say one of the first, there's probably thousands of them by then, but like it felt like one of the first. And we we started putting out content on there and built up a, a very large following. At the same time, you know, WeChat Pay was just kicking off, and I remember very clearly going into a, a convenience store um, in Chongqing. And, uh, and and realizing that I could actually pay with my phone and whipping out WeChat and then paying for my, probably my, my Coke at the time or whatever I was, I was buying and being like, oh, wow, this is, you know, this is really cool. And, and this is really going to, this is really going to change China and perhaps the world to actually experience that back then and think, wow, this is, this is something. And I went to a startup weekend around that time as well, which is like a was was a really great experience. We went from Chongqing to Chengdu, and there's kind of a rivalry between those two cities. So we were a bit. Me and my friends went over to to go to this weekend event and and start doing this basically this competition around startups, and and we were a little bit intimidated. But as it turned out, you know, there was a massive energy in the room. We came second in the end with an idea about a WeChat CRM, all of which we totally didn't do. Uh, <laughs> because we didn't know anything about CRM, but we did get a you know an amazing vibe and energy from all of the judges, all of the mentors saying you know this area is blowing up, it's really hot right now. You guys should do something. So we did, and uh, I went off to Beijing. Then I we went down to Shanghai. Now the team's in Shenzhen. We're pretty close to Tencent head office. We do a bit of agency work. I do a lot of training. I do a lot of speaking around the world, all around basically WeChat, but also now Tencent. And it's been a sort of roller coaster ride, I guess. But yeah, we're in a very nice place right now. And uh, so China keeps on giving. Uh, I think a lot of people um, that I know uh, who've been here a long time, you know, we all have these sort of like end up doing things that we just imagine would never be possible when we started. So China's also given you a book. So what motivated you to put all your Tencent knowledge down into one place? Yeah, uh, the main motivation for that was, well, A, there's a huge difference in level of awareness and quality of you know books or just analysis and content in English language between Alibaba and Tencent. There's been several very good books written about Jack Ma's journey and uh, the early days of Alibaba. Right now, as we're recording this podcast, there's virtually no books that are any good. I mean, someone's going to correct me, but <laughs> there's, it's very difficult, let's say, that's an uncontroversial statement. It's very difficult to find a good book about Tencent in English. So why is that? Is Jack Ma just that compelling a character? Certainly, Jack Ma is a very special character and lends himself towards um, a great story. He did things like filming the early meetings that they had as a, as a team, which is kind of mental, like only a crazy person would really do that. But because of stuff like that, he, there's all these sort of artifacts and, 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 and things of like the very early days, 
Also, Alibaba is a very open international company. Jack speaks great English. And they had like very, you know, they brought on board uh, managers from from all over the world as well, like uh, at a much earlier stage. So whereas Tencent, the, the founder, Pony Ma, is much more introverted. He's a geek and they're not a very strong company at PR. They're not, they're not very good at telling their stories. They're very typical sort of Guangdong businessmen in terms of like keep your head down and like just get on with your business. They're very product focused. They're, they're really, Tencent strength has always been uh, creating great products that Chinese consumers love. It's not been, and investing as well. They're pretty good at investing, but it's never been in sort of telling stories or doing things B2B where you have to communicate and, uh, and really tell your story. Uh, for them, I do a lot of media stuff now and I get people from, uh, Wall Street Journal or Bloomberg journalists. I'm not going to name names, but like, you know, it's, it's, it's well known that Tencent's pretty bad at doing PR, pretty bad at doing investor relationships. Like they do it because they have to. And I'll say that because I know Tencent people will also say that to me. <laughs> like <laughs> They're a very interesting company and their story's not being told at all. A very, very large part of the revenue comes from games. And they're actually the world's largest gaming company. And so you've got this company where the core is that they're known for messaging and WeChat sort of their flagship product now. And it's known to be the most innovative products that they've produced. Certainly one of the most innovative products to come out of China. And that's what people focus on. But actually, the a large part of their business is still, you know, gaming, which is the, the two are linked, but in many ways, they're separate. So why did Tencent create WeChat in the first place? So WeChat came along really with the beginnings of mobile in China. And at the time in 2010, this was early days for for the App Store and the early days for iPhone. And and there's really a sort of, you know, this period was very formative. If you look back on the history in China of of the tech industry, there's a lot of activity and a lot of big names that came out at this time. You know, this is Xiaomi started around this time. Uh, and um, WhatsApp was, you know, it is today the the biggest messenger product. WhatsApp really started from day one uh, on the App Store. They came in like at the perfect time, like actually when the iPhone actually introduced push messaging. So that's when I say push messaging, that's like you get a red dot on the app when someone sends you a message. That was very early on in terms of the iPhone uh, in, in rolling out features and functionality. But before that, messaging didn't really work, right? It was like, if you got a message, you wouldn't actually know you got it until you actually opened up the app. So WhatsApp were there from day one, but it wasn't WhatsApp that inspired Tencent to, to do this. It was actually an app called Kick, Kick Messenger, um, which really blew up in 2010. I think in the space of about two weeks, it got like a million uh, users, which was just unheard of. It was like, this was crazy numbers back then. And so this sort of woke up the whole of China, uh, of the, uh, all the tech companies, all the internet companies were like, oh, kick messenger, right? Let's do it. Let's, let's copy this. Let's do this. Copy to China. Is this still very much copied to China era? And so there was a whole bunch of clones of kick. So the, the, the main players in the market early on were eventually WeChat, but also uh, MeTalk from Xiaomi uh, was, uh, you know, Xiaomi before they started releasing phones, they actually had a very strong play in this market. And it quite easily, it could have been MeTalk uh, that won this war, uh, not Tencent. And we'd all be using Xiaomi uh, for, for messaging in China. Um, as it was, they, it didn't turn out that way. And there was another player in the mix called uh, TalkBox, which was from Hong Kong. And they actually introduced the uh, walkie-talkie feature. So this walkie-talkie feature, which has become like so synonymous with WeChat, and a lot of people think it, you know, it comes from Tencent, and it was one of the bigger innovations early on. Uh, it totally was not their innovation. It was from it was from this app called TalkBots, which they copied over. Uh, the whole idea of doing a messenger was also copied from Kick. So there's not actually very much innovation that Tencent did in this area. But what we what what happened was, uh, you know. WeChat was launched uh, from the Guangzhou division of, of Tencent, which was called the Guang at the time it was called uh, the Guangzhou Research uh, Team, which was actually an email team. So the guy who led, who's known as the founder of WeChat, which is Alan Zhang, who's quite a mysterious character in in, in Chinese uh, tech circles, he sent an email, famously sent an email to Pony Ma one night and says, "Look, I want to develop um, a Kick for China," and Pony Ma quickly said, "Yeah, let's do it." 
they they built it in a couple of months and they launched it and it can you know it got very bad reviews right if you look at the early reviews of wechat on the app store um they're terrible it's got loads of one star reviews and nobody wants to use it because everyone's using qq and and qq had a messenger uh, had a, a mobile version so it wasn't obvious in the early days why you would use wechat at all and it had really no distinct advantage over the other players in the market. When things really turned around for WeChat was version 2.0, which was in May 2011, where they introduced the walkie-talkie voice feature that I just mentioned that they cloned from TalkBox. So this, again, is when you can press a button to record and send a voice memo instead of having to type out a message with your fingers. Exactly. So rather than typing, you're talking into the phone and you're doing it very much like you would with a walkie-talkie device. Uh, short bursts of 60 seconds. Uh, there's, there's a variety of reasons why it's more popular here in, in China, and basically in Asian countries. And, you know, you've mentioned, you've alluded to a couple of them there. So that was one of it. And the other feature that they released that really was a, a game changer early on at the same time, roughly around 2.0, was um, this feature called Friends Nearby. And Friends Nearby allows you to add people uh, basically based on your geolocation. So I can open up Friends Nearby on WeChat, and it's still a feature that's there today. You can try it out now if you want, if you've got WeChat on your phone. It's on the Discovery tab, I believe, and you just go into Friends Nearby, and you can set it so that it's, uh, you know, you can see everyone, or you can see just men, or you can see just women. So you can already, you know, you can tell what this was used for. Um, it, It was basically WeChat early on became the first Tinder of China. And this really drove a huge amount of engagement in the app because this is pre-Tinder. There's no Tinder. There's no uh, Momo was the uh, other Chinese app in this area, um, which came out about the same time. But this was quite revolutionary and like really uh, created a lot of buzz. And it was something that, that no other app really had at the time. So there was those couple of things. And then they started, you know, Tencent realized that actually messaging is going to be big like on the phone actually messaging is kind of the killer app for the phone right for if you look across the world on on sort of mobile phones uh, messaging is typically the thing that people spend most time in it's like it's the killer application that wasn't obvious when the iphone came out that messaging would be so important but around about you know early 2011 was when it became clear to Tencent that, you know, we need to put a lot more effort into this than we're doing right now. And actually, this is a very dangerous time for us because we could lose we could lose our preeminence in social. So they put a lot of effort into, like, driving QQ users over, making it easy to drag your social graph from QQ over into WeChat. And so once they realized that and made that easy to do, then pretty much the war was over because <laughs> this was a war that was basically 10 cents to lose. Um, So those were the real factors early on that that drove it. So the the friends nearby, the walkie-talkie, and the social graph from QQ. And the combination of those three, plus a bunch of other stuff, they they did some very early on in the first year. They brought out some other features like Shake. Listeners are familiar like this. uh, You can shake your phone on WeChat and get, you know, coupons and things like that. Or actually add friends that way as well, which were really novel and quite innovative at the time and, and... did create a lot of buzz and helped, um, but it was really those key f- three things that, that drove the early on user engagement. How do the demographics of the user base evolve over time? Yeah, um, so I think WeChat grew along with mobile in China. Uh, it's quite rare to find someone who has a mobile phone that's uh, you know not a uh, feature phone, an s- actual smartphone that doesn't have WeChat on their phone today, even up to like quite elderly seniors. It's quite unique in that respect. Uh, what we found out through recent IPOs with uh, Pindodo is that actually there is a huge demographic in China that don't even use apps like Taobao, which you would consider to be like some of the most popular apps that actually there's a there's a, a section of society, which I'm, I'm really thinking of more rural areas and, 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 and senior people who really might use WeChat and that's about it. Uh, And they might have a couple of other apps on their phones, but WeChat's really just the one thing they use uh, if they on a daily basis and that's to communicate with family usually so that's where we are today how we got there from from that was you know those uh, the very early adopters of wechat were actually driven from qq mail so the wechat team which owned qq mail uh, put adverts in there to drive those users over you know after a certain time there's a wave of early adopters with the friends nearby and, and dating and things like that 
and it was very much weighted towards smartphone users in tier one cities. And it's kind of just, you know, spread out between now and then. It's grown along with, if you look at the number of smartphone users and the number of WeChat users, they're highly correlated for, for China. The question that a lot of people ask is, you know, what about WeChat outside China? Because that's a much more murky area, right? There's like, how many WeChat users are there outside China? Tencent's never announced that. They've never said anything. Um, and we, we only really have estimates to go by. Perhaps that's because those international numbers aren't super impressive. Well, they have to be. I mean, like, I would estimate it's at least 100 million. Who are all these people, do you think? Um, yeah, Chinese outside China, um, students, you know, air hostesses, wherever, you know, people uh, actually just mainlanders outside of outside of the mainland. Then you've got ethnically Chinese people who often will have WeChat to communicate with family back home, even though they're they're, they're, they're not from the mainland now. And then you've got a lot of people doing business with China as well. Anyone who has some kind of strong connection with the mainland will probably have WeChat on their phone. So that's those are the three groups predominantly. Now let's come back to the product evolution story. Should we just jump straight to mini apps here? Oh, there's, there's so much. I mean, like there's uh, official accounts, which are kind of similar to Facebook pages. If you don't know what they are, that's the easiest way to explain it. But like there's a whole ecosystem of content in there that was built up. Official accounts are still basically more popular than websites in China, right? As a business, you're more likely to have an official account than you are to have your own website in China. I think that's still true today. That whole ecosystem was built up. Uh, around 2012 to 2014 it's been massive success you've got the moments news feed in there so it's like there's this whole publishing system which is decentralized and it content is essentially shared on a news feed and in wechat groups and that's how it flows around the system there's also search as well but that's very much secondary and and this has been this is still the largest content ecosystem in china massive success story and brands and, and businesses will all have official accounts and often they'll be you'll be able to buy things on them you'll be able to book a hotel room or you know get a, a dd taxi or whatever and so that leads into the second big thing which is uh, wechat pay which was a you know probably the the biggest and most important success of the, of, of them all and WeChat Pay really exploded 2014, 2015, which was a revolution for China. And I think the repercussions of it are still playing out today where, you know, there's a cashless revolution. Everyone's paying with their phones. We don't carry wallets anymore. Yes, you know, this brings back to the whole thing about Alibaba and uh, Tencent is that Actually, uh, you know, the story about Alipay is, is, um, has been very well communicated by Alibaba to all of the sort of people who are interested in fintech. There's a lot more written about that than there is about what WeChat Pay did. But actually, WeChat Pay played an extremely important role in, in popularizing this. And I think it's fair to say that we wouldn't be where we are today with mobile payments in China if we wouldn't be anywhere near where we are today if it wasn't for WeChat Pay. Uh, Alipay, yes, were the you know in this market for and, and you know, this is another popular misconception. You know, Alipay's been around for a long time. Everyone knows that. Like two thousand four, I think, uh, of two thousand three is back when they started uh, as a as an escrow system for Taobao on the desktop. You know, but Tencent's also been doing payments for you know uh, since two thousand five, but it's not really talked about. But they've been doing it for gaming. Right and and actually there was a whole time in in China there's these things called Q coins uh, QQ coins right which became an alternative currency to RMB there's a whole story there about how like there was a the craze about QQ coins and and at one stage uh, you know the government got really scared about it and had you know shut it down because everyone was trading this virtual currency this is before Bitcoin we had a past guest who was talking about how this was the original Bitcoin regulation, the Qcoin phenomenon. And there's literally nothing in English on it. It's fascinating. Exactly. Yes, the Qcoin phenomenon is not talked about. I don't think you can find nothing in English, but like this is the original Bitcoin. You know, Tencent has such a rich, amazing history uh, that's just not being communicated to the Western world. Uh, and if Alibaba had done this, everyone would know about it. <laughs> so, but because because Pony Mars just you know not got this doesn't really care about PR, so nobody nobody really talks about it in English. Um, but yeah, so Tencent's been doing payments and 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 virtual currencies and things like this for for almost as long as Alibaba has, and uh, for the cashless revolution, going back to WeChat Pay, you know, the the role they played with Lucky Money was. You know, lucky money essentially brought mobile payments to the masses. It's no exaggeration to say that it sped up. It you know, it just put 
poured petrol on this whole thing. Uh, lucky money is this um, a concept, you know, at Chinese New Year, you give lucky money. It's a thousand year old tradition of, you know, giving lucky money in a red envelope and you don't know how much is in the envelope till you open it. You give it to children, you give it to elders. And Tencent basically took this and digitalized it, which wasn't a new thing. Lots of people digitalized it before. It was quite an obvious thing to do actually for Chinese companies. But usually when they're digital, well, always up until, up until WeChat got hold of it, when they digitalized Lucky Money, it was essentially a discount coupon. So uh, that's not very fun. <laughs> um, but WeChat made it super fun by saying, okay, this is not a discount coupon. This is a peer-to-peer -peer transaction. And it's one where the amounts are randomized. So it's almost like gambling. And it's based around speed as well. So there's this speed element that when you share Lucky Money in a WeChat group, you have to be fast in order to open it. And then what the amount you get is randomized between the people who receive it. So um, Lucky Money, actually, when it first came out, there was a lot of gambling that happened on WeChat um, because there originally wasn't this 200 yuan limit, which they have now. Sure. Um, and actually, that's why that's the core reason why there is a limit is because it was being used by gambling, uh, gambling groups. And, and, and there was an incredible amount of, of gambling going on with using Lucky Money. Um, but most people were using it for, you know, just fun. It was just a really f killer feature that became super successful and people were uh, very excited about suddenly you could go into WeChat groups and, and wait for like real money that you could spend to pop out. Um, so this brought, when I say, you know, why was this poured petrol on the whole uh, mobile payments thing was because um, suddenly pretty much everyone had some kind of money on their WeChat. Uh, back in the early days, you didn't even need to bind your bank card. So you could just get money, uh, small amounts of money from WeChat groups. And then you have some balance on your WeChat now. And then people realized, you know, this is real money. I can use this in a taxi. I, I can use this. So this revolution of, of, especially from WeChat's perspective, was a very much a bottom-up revolution where street vendors started accepting WeChat pay before, you know, the brands in, in big shopping malls did. Sure. So... You've, I've got, you know, even just a tiny amount, like 30 UN, like $5 on my WeChat, but it's, you know, I, I, I want to use it, right? So the street vendor takes it. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll buy some fruit with that. So it started from there, from these tiny, tiny transactions. And now WeChat has, has sort of grown from there and it's become more accepted. It's taken pretty much universally. Where we are today now is, you know, there's very few scenarios where, unless it's a large amount of money that you you won't be able to use WeChat or Alipay um, to to make that transaction in China. You know, we're here today in Beijing. Actually, I, I didn't bring my wallet to Beijing, and that wasn't deliberate. I forgot when I was I was rushed out the house today. So I'm here in my, you know I'm only here for about a day, and I'm going back to to Sichuan. But I feel fine. I've got my phone, and I'm going to make many transactions while I'm here. I paid for my hotel. I paid for a taxi. I'm probably going to pay for a, a food delivery at some point, and maybe a coffee. And I don't need a wallet. So that just shows how far we've gone. And so WeChat Pay has been an incredible success for Tencent. They're getting all this data now about transactions, real transactions that are happening in the economy. Yes, they make a bit of money on it as well. Uh, actually, that, that the money that both Amp Financial and Tencent make is, is quite low, uh, the cut they make. And the government's in, introducing some quite draconian regulations as well. So... Um, in terms of like being a very profitable business, it's you know looking increasingly gloomy in, in that respect for these companies. This doesn't work like credit cards in the US where every time you swipe your Amex, Amex takes 3%, right? No, there's a huge difference between the States and what in, in China in terms of the, the cut that these, these companies are getting. In China, it's typically 0.6% and peer-to-peer -peer transactions are free. And um, you know, if you're doing cross-border WeChat Pay or Alipay, it goes up to about two, three percent. But even there, the channel or the, the middleman, the distributor, which is what they all work with, you know, they'll have a cut, and it's actually getting that's getting compressed as well over time. Sure. Yeah, so it's uh, it's a very low margin business, but of course the transaction volumes are huge, right? So it's still, you know, overall they're still making a lot of money on it. Essentially, Tencent was losing money on it for a stage, and now they they seem to be making money overall. The financials are very opaque. It's quite difficult to actually work out what's going on. And there are several ways that they can make money through financial products as well, which is the main reason why Amp Financial is valued at you know the $150 billion, I think it is now. But that also leads into what they've done with Eurobao, which is the world's largest money fund, which 
was actually at a similar time to when WeChat Pay took off and, and did have a, an amazing effect in terms of people took a lot of their money out of their bank accounts and put it into Alipay because it had a, a very, very different, uh, there's a big delta in term of, uh, of difference there in terms of the interest rate from the state-owned banks, which were giving you about 2%, and Alipay, which was giving you about 6% or something like that. So I remember around that time also my wife, you know, really bugging me to <laughs> take all my money and put it in her Alipay because uh, she's like, yeah, come on, you're crazy. Like, why'd you put your money in the bank? Um, you know, as a foreigner, I've tried a lot of these financial products and every single one of them needs a Shenf and Junk. Yeah, that's it. I can't test it using my own uh, passport. It's impossible. Yeah. So now let's turn to the most recent product innovation, mini apps. So within a span of two years, this feature has created publicly listed companies all within this, what, five megabyte limit. So what have mini programs done for the ecosystem? Well, I think mini programs is um, a very bold initiative. Um, it's really coming from Alan Jung, uh, who I mentioned before is uh, the founder of WeChat. He's kind of a mysterious figure. He speaks once a year at the WeChat annual conference, and, and that's it. No, no real public appearances beyond that. Actually, quite a poor speaker, but he is looked up to as, as one of the real innovator, innovators. You know, this is the guy who, back in the day, single-handedly coded Foxmail, which was a very one of the market-leading email clients for not just China but also globally. And he's like really very, very talented developer and has had some major success stories with Foxmail, later QQ Mail, and now WeChat. And so when this guy stands up and basically says, you know, about two years ago or so, he, he got on the stage, which he never does, and basically said, I have a dream. And that dream's mini programs. So everyone got like super excited like uh, about it. And quite rightly so. I mean, like it's not, Alan Jung never does that. So, but when they came out, there was massive disappointment about many programs because, you know, if it was a dream, it was kind of a nightmare. It was, they, they didn't really do much and nobody could understand why you would be excited about this. Um, but uh, it, it was quite clear that uh, Tencent higher management saw a lot in this and they were talking about it on earnings calls and WeChat team was making a lot of noise about it. So I, I and I spoke to WeChat team people when I was at the conferences and like I was I I got it I understood like okay this is this is actually a very very big thing, um so they were, they were written off for about half a year by all media, and then after about half a year people started realizing oh this is actually you know there, there seemed to be an uptick in traffic, and there was an uptick in 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 interest and that's really gone through till today where month on month traffic for mini programs has, has gone up uh, they launched mini games a lot of the things they said they weren't going to do at the beginning now they're doing and it's really started to become a vibrant ecosystem within wechat but mini programs really are just apps they're just uh, they they originally were called mini apps they couldn't use those words because um, Apple wouldn't let them. So that's why they're not called apps. That's why they're called this awkward mini program thing, which doesn't sound very good in English. It sounds a lot better in Chinese. They're just apps, right? And and it's it's um it's actually a reimagining, a re a re a total reset of the official account system. So official accounts, which are still today uh, a massive part of WeChat, the way they work is like email. Actually, it's very very similar to email in that it's all about the push notification. So as a as a brand, if I have my WeChat official account, I've got a million followers. Once a week, I can send them, I can spam them, right? I can send them an email. And WeChat in China is your email box and you get like this notification. So, okay, I've, I can send a push notification to my million followers and they've got a red dot and they're going to click on it because nobody likes that red dot. And you go in, uh, it's very, very similar like when you get an email, you have to like delete it. But that's a pretty crappy experience for a user and it's got its limitations for a business as well. So is the I think many programs was very much about like realizing that this official accounts system has done extremely well, but it's also got some major limitations and it needs to be totally rethought. So that's what they're doing. And um, there's a couple of other things that are, are really important about it. You know, uh, they realized for e-commerce that they needed to make e-commerce much better experience on WeChat, that it was too clunky, clumsy. Doing it on web pages was just not good. They're never, ever going to be able to compete with Alibaba with the current with the old system. 
and uh, and with many programs now it's a much much more fluid better faster experience much more like a native app much more like Taobao if you want it to be so there's a there's a big chunk there and that's that's why we've seen as i alluded to earlier companies like pindodor have been able to reach a massive scale basically through wechat traffic and that wouldn't have been possible without many programs one of the big questions around mini programs with regard to e-commerce is that one of the main ways JD and Alibaba have monetized their platforms is, you know, charging vendors for traffic. So this isn't something Tencent's currently doing right now. How does the model differ for them? Oh, from Tencent's point of view, you know, they can monetize it um, in a couple of ways uh, and, and very traditional ways, right? So advertisements, um, which we've seen they've they've rolled out already for games and and, uh, and also for e-commerce as well. And then the actual transaction itself, they do take you know it's all WeChat Pay transactions, so they've got a small cut on that. And then they can do things like search advertisements as well, which they're experimenting with. Um, so there's a couple of ways that they can monetize it. They're all pretty traditional ways that you would monetize apps as well. So, but actually, I don't think that's the core reason. You know, that is a benefit for sure, and I'm sure the amounts of money that they're going to make from mini program ads will will increase uh, quite you know quite steadily for the next couple of years. But it's not really the main benefit of why they're doing it. I mean, they could have done that on official accounts without changing anything. As you said, on the one hand, you see the innovation, but there's also a really conservative streak in not wanting to kill the golden goose, which is really what Tencent has on its hands with WeChat. Yeah, um, but I, I think the mini programs has the potential to be quite disruptive eventually. And uh, I think they are also realizing that, like I said, there was a major problem with the way that the old official account system worked it wasn't in, in Alan Jung's own words. It was very unnatural how you you know you went into uh, a, an official account to discover a business. Uh, many programs work very well offline as well. So it's a big part of it is like okay, how can we make the WeChat experience really great for offline scenarios, as they say in in, in that sort of. Tencent talks about scenarios a lot. Um, no, and so, you know, give you some examples. You know, you're, uh, you're, you're in the supermarket and uh, you can actually, um, as of today, I think Walmart's doing it. I think Carrefour's doing it. You know, they're using mini programs so you can just self-check out, right? You just scan, scan the products and, and pay on WeChat. Yeah, you could do that with a normal web page, I guess. But um, there's a lot of small advantage, advantages by doing it for a mini program. Um, it, it just works a lot smoother. It's a lot faster. Um, they can, you know, in terms of the experience for after sales, customer service, and things like that. It's there's there's all these advantages, and so that's one of the big things they're going for is is you know things like retail and using mini programs to like make retail experiences better. So there are also a number of potential threats facing Tencent. On the most recent earnings call, the big story was gaming regulatory approvals. And, you know, as a shameless 28-year-old gamer myself, I was nearly going to buy this new hot title, Monster Hunter World, on Tencent's platform Wii Game, since it was like 30% cheaper than Steam. But I'm thankful I'm not, because just within two days, it disappears from Tencent's shameless copy of Steam. Um, so the charges that the government put on this game were nudity and violence, which is frankly ridiculous because there's much, much racier stuff on the Wii game platform right now being sold freely in China. Um, so what do you think this and other gaming regulatory challenges? Uh, so, so why in particular do you think this and other gaming regulatory challenges aren't necessarily quite as big a deal as some analysts may say? Yeah, so there's been a lot of talk of that very recently. I think it's quite topical as of we are recording this. Um, it seems to be that regulation for gaming industry in China is uh, certainly stricter than ever and has right now uh, is affecting the entire industry. Uh, what, uh, so, and we've seen quite recently, uh, so well, for most of this year, in fact, that the share price for Tencent has, has really been tanking uh, with quite quite different to last year where it was doubled um over 2000 more than doubled over 2017 so it's been a bit of a roller coaster ride and one of the reasons why people are seemingly bearish on Tencent is because they believe you know there's, there's this heavy regulation uh, increasingly heavy re regulation um in Chinese gaming industry uh but my my take on this is is a little bit different in that i think actually regulation usually 
plays into the incumbents. The, the largest firms in the industry usually benefit most because they have this sort of lock-in. Uh, the extra regulation or just um, risk, regulatory risk, is uh, something that smaller firms and mid-sized firms cannot deal with very well. And so from Tencent's perspective, yeah, it's not great when their games get suddenly taken off of the Wii game platform, but we have to assume that they're not being singled out and that this is an industry-wide problem and one which overall actually can play to their strengths of like having, by being the biggest player, they have the best connections, they're able to deal with their games. Um, you know, the other big thing that people are talking about is their two flagship titles right now, which are these uh, shoot the Battle Royale shooter games which are incredibly popular of currently in china they can't monetize them um they have the resources to take that hit uh, given their size uh, a mid-level company probably wouldn't um so overall uh, and if you're going to license a game into the chinese market if you have a killer title that you've developed in 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 europe or wherever um tencent e- even more so now is is the obvious choice to do because you know that the risk is very high that there's going to be some kind of problem with the regulators. Uh, you want to reduce that risk, and, and Tencent's still the best bet. It's fascinating, even for games that have really zero moral issues, like, say, Fortnite. The government has just decided to make this a cue for, for establishing approval to monetize. On the other hand, Chinese people aren't necessarily going to stop playing games anytime soon, and it's clear that the government appreciates the importance of these corporate champions and doesn't really want to you know, strangle Tencent out of existence. On the other hand, though... Taking a- action against games does really line up with the whole Xi national revitalization push. Sure. Um, I think that Tencent's already taken some steps to uh, make it clear that they're, they're trying to put in place systems where parents can monitor the amount of time that their children are spending on, on these platforms, uh, where there's sort of limits on, on the amount that, that children of you know, young adults, even up to a certain age, can spend per day or, or you know per month on the platforms uh on, on the games and i believe that yeah overall that they that that would definitely be the worst case scenario is that there, there's some sort of mid ground where they say okay you can some very heavy regulation comes in in terms of monetization where uh, you can have the titles but you you're sort of crippling them in terms of monetizing uh, and that was really my point in the piece as well was like I don't see the government really crippling Tencent in that. They, they, I think they're probably very aware that the cash cow is still gaming, and if you have a serious impact on that, then Tencent won't, you know, won't be the company that it is today. And uh, Tencent's one of only two companies that China has that really can take on the Googles, the the Facebooks, the Amazons, uh, which. So it would really be shooting themselves in the foot to to do to to make that move. It's also not like these government officials don't like playing games. I'm sure you've seen these stories of government officials getting caught playing Wang Zhongyao during meetings and having these photos of their levels going viral. <laughs> I think I have at least 2,000 liked videos on Douyin, and aside from WeChat, it's probably the app I spent most time on in China. So just to explain briefly, it's similar to Vine. The idea is that there are these videos from five seconds to up to two minutes um, on a incredibly wide range of topics so what's interesting for the uh the douyin story is both the explosive growth as well as the you know diversity of content that it's developed so it started out mostly as a like lick syncing videos college kids making funny jokes um but now the um the content ecosystem is extraordinarily rich and the fun part is that the ai is so good that it really knows almost every single one of my uh one of my interests so i get served alongside these funny college videos stuff about chinese history badminton Beijing restaurants, basketball, hip hop, basically like everything I am interested in. Um, Douyin has through its algorithm basically figured out that I um, that I like. So it, it's gotten to a point though that the app, which once really felt like a guilty pleasure, is now something um, where I almost feel good using because I feel like I'm learning stuff. You know, when every fourth swipe is is a new badminton technique or like something about some Qing Dynasty emperor, um, and every third swipe I am literally laughing out loud 
So, so anyways, coming back to Tencent, the fear then is that ByteDance, with its success in building products, has been able to take a bite out of the time people spend on Tencent products each day. I think there was some there was some uh, survey that you um, that you quoted recently saying that six percent of that that Chinese people now spend six percent of the time on their phone using ByteDance products, and which is directly taken out of the share that Tencent products had only a year ago. So, so what exactly? Are the folks at Tencent scared of? Um, well, I wouldn't. I, I, <laughs> I wouldn't say the Tencent headquarters people are scared necessarily. Uh, I was speaking to a couple of people yesterday, so um, they no. But I'm. I'm certainly would say that investors must be concerned about this. Um, attention is a zero sum game, and uh, just from listening, uh, our listeners, just from hearing you enthusiastically describe. You know, uh, your experience using Douyin tells you everything about how um, this app is increasingly becoming uh, the go-to place when people want to kill time. Uh, and of course, that means they're spending less time on Tencent video. They'll be spending less time on WeChat official accounts. Uh, and the numbers are starting to show that. Uh, the numbers are not really showing a fall uh, so much in Tencent's financials. Um, Tencent's famously conservative with, mon- with uh, its monetization of um, eyeballs in terms of advertisements. So compared to companies like Facebook or Google that we might be more familiar with, uh, Tencent does a terrible job of monetizing uh, attention. And they're quite conservative. You know, they... they 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 put it forward as you know a very deliberate strategy than one of a sort of like they don't really want to make things overly commercial i get it um it did take me a while to 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 really understand it but um i i think they're being quite quite genuine when they say that it's not just that they they can't do it um but uh so so for 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 bite dance you know this is how bite dance is making their money for, with with advertisements uh, predominantly right now um, but it's more about that there's an alternative ecosystem for pan entertainment. You know, Tencent's um, core business really boils down to when you get when you throw all the investments because, you know, they make so many investments, right? Take the investments out of the pie, right? And forget about those for a second. What is Tencent at its core? Yes, it's a social company. Obviously, QQ, WeChat, these are core products. Yes, it's a gaming company. Um, and then the third pillar is really pan entertainment when you look at like uh, things like literature, manga, uh, music, you know, they dominate these areas. Uh, they license with Tencent Video. They license a lot of, sort of sporting content and things like that. Uh, they've got two different movie divisions. It's about online entertainment is one of their core, you know, areas that they see as essential to what is Tencent. And that pillar is really kind of under threat now. Byte Dance has overtaken Alibaba. It's overtaken Baidu just in terms of time that people spent. Uh, obviously, Alibaba is a much bigger company, and you know, when you buy something on one of their platforms, you might not be spending a lot of time, but you're spending a lot of money, and maybe that's better. But in terms of just attention, eyeballs, which is very important when we talk about entertainment, they've gone from zero to one, and then they've done this one trick. Before, we kind of looked at Byte Dancers as one trick pony. Oh, they've got Totiao, but yeah, they've got a bunch of other apps, and uh, they're not really that good. Like, Totiao's the main one. Even Totiao, you know, it's just super, super lowbrow. The best analogy that I've been able to come up, with, come up with to explain it is world star hip hop. And shout out to any China Econ Talk listeners out there who appreciate that reference. And please let me know on Twitter so I don't feel like a, a complete weirdo. Yeah, um, so there's been a lot written about um, bite dance uh, in Chinese media, I think, over the past year. Um, they... it. It's a bit confusing for us outside, for people less familiar with the situation, because ByteDance is a company that um, was mostly referred to in English as as Totiao, as Daily Headline, because that was their fa- flagship product uh, last year, and then in certainly in the f- in the first half of 2018, um, this other platform Douyin just just exploded. I mean, really exploded in terms of um, daily active users, monthly active users. And not just inside China, but also outside China. Uh, I think it's got to be candidate for the tech story of 2018, certainly the first half. If you look at the valuation of ByteDance last year, we did an episode on our podcast where we were uh, exclaiming and, and trying to get our heads around the fact that this newsfeed company was 20 billion, 30 billion. Now it's more like 75 is what they're 
people are saying that they're gone for. No, they're not public yet. It could easily be over a hundred at some point soon. So, and, and just this is just massive, massive growth. And if you go around China today and you're on a subway or any in any kind of public area, you're going to see people on on Douyin. I mean, it's a seriously、um, hot product right now and very addictive. The other big story here, and the thing that ByteDance has been able to figure out in a way Tencent hasn't, is how to directly internationalize their products. Douyin's been able to create TikTok, which is now this huge, huge, huge app in Japan, Indonesia, South Korea, and、uh, you know, having taken over Musically, is making inroads into the U.S. as well. So we were talking earlier about how Tencent's reach is really bounded by these ethnic, by the ethnic Chinese abroad,、um, with the exception maybe of this Wanzhong Yao internationalization in Southeast Asia. Sure, I mean a lot of people have said, you know, this micro video, Douyin TikTok thing, you know, this is something that Tencent should have been doing, right? I mean, it's clearly、um, before you would expect them if, if you if you didn't know who developed this app and. You 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 traveled in from the past into where we are today and said who built this? You'd put oh this must be Tencent right? This is clearly Tencent's territory, and 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 Tencent is a situation now where the user numbers on WeChat are kind of plateauing.、Um, it's you know it's been around for a while, very mature platform.、Uh, gaming is still going very strong, but you know there's no there's no growth story to tell investors. You know the growth story is kind of getting fuzzy. Before they had this like really nice line of WeChat users going to the right and going up every quarter like really strongly, and now that's sort of fading. It's like where is the next story for Tencent? It should have been a product like Douyin,、uh, but it's not. They've kind of the ship sailed. They do have a they do have a product in that category called Weixi in English. It's called Weixiu in Chinese.、Uh, I'm not very optimistic about its chances. The ship, in my opinion, the ship sailed.、Uh, Douyin's won the war. And、uh, TikTok will probably do some very interesting things outside China, and we could end up seeing that ByteDance becomes a much more international company than Tencent has ever been. You know, well, actually, the, to be fair to Tencent, you know they are a very international company in gaming, through investments, much more than people realize. But in terms of their core products, which they own, I think ByteDance is already arguably more international now. There's been a lot of talk、uh, of Tencent becoming an investment company. That the value of their investments is now actually larger than the value of their core products and and the actual company in terms of what they you know the value put on WeChat and everything that they they built themselves. So that's in some ways you could say that's a great success.、Um, Tencent very early on, well not very, not so early on, but like a, a long time back, you know, made the choice. Pony Ma as Took the president、uh, Martin Lau from Goldman Sachs, and they got、uh, James Mitchell also from Goldman Sachs、um, in their higher management team. So there's a very very strong influence of banking in there, and、uh, they made a very、uh, deliberate decision. Also around the time of WeChat, around 2011, they made this choice that we were going to、um, start investing、um, and sharing resources, sharing、uh, monetary resources that they had across the. Internet sector in China and and abroad, but also traffic as well. And so they've built up as you know many many different strategic partnerships, and they've invested in all kinds of startups almost on a weekly basis. You're going to hear Tencent's invested in this, or they've invested in that, and much more so than we see in the states with the Valley companies of you know、uh, Google or, or、um, Microsoft or whatever. They, they, there's a lot more investment that happens from from the from the big giants here in China, and so you could say that's been successful. But on the other hand, there's a lot of people criticizing it, saying you know Tencent is really becoming like the Berkshire Hathaway of 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 internet companies、uh, for China, and、uh, they're not able to innovate internally as much as they as they used to. Having said that, you know going back to what we talked about very much earlier in the podcast about WeChat. I think it's personally it's questionable whether they really did innovate early on.、Uh, I think that just the stars were aligned in some respects. I think it's much easier to argue they innovated with WeChat Pay rather than actually WeChat. And certainly the original product of QQ was not innovative at all. It was a clone. So. It's questionable whether Tencent's ever ever been very innovative, and and maybe it doesn't need to be.、Um, but certainly they're struggling, I think, for a story, right, a growth story to tell investors right now. Matt, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. A pleasure.